Welcome to Lecture 5 of BIB 102, the New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be finishing up on the Gospel of Matthew and going through all of Gospel of Mark. So let's get started. Continuing our notes, number two, only Matthew records the first commission to the twelve. Now, if you remember from the previous lecture in lecture four, we're going over teachings of Christ that are unique to Matthew. So in this one, this teaching that he's going to give the twelve is very important. However, before we get into detail on what they were commissioned to do and to whom they were commissioned to go, we need to discuss who the individuals were. So let's talk about letter A. Who did he choose? Who did Jesus decide these are the 12 individuals that I am going to use for a special ministry? Well, let's go through that list. In the listing that Matthew gives us, the first person he talks about is Simon Peter. Very popular one. We'll talk about him a lot more in detail in this class as well. Number two is Andrew, Peter's brother. So now we have the first two individuals are brothers. Number three is James. Number four is John, James's brother. These two brothers, John and James, are called the sons of Zebedee, also named the sons of thunder, which we're going to have another lecture later. We'll discuss why they were called the sons of thunder. Then you have number five, Philip. And Philip went and actually recruited Number six, Bartholomew. Now, his real name is Nathaniel. Only the Gospel of John tells us that. But in the Synoptic Gospels, he's always called Bartholomew, which literally means son of Ptolemy. So his dad's name was Ptolemy, and apparently he was an important man, um, or he wouldn't have been named Bartholomew. Then number seven, Thomas, a very uh, famous individual because he was not present when Jesus first resurrected and appeared before the 11 disciples. And he's also called Didymus, which means one of two in Greek. So he was actually a twin. Then number eight is Matthew, Levi. We are actually in his book right now talking about him, so he should be familiar. Number nine is James, the son of Alphaeus and brother of Labius. Many times he's called James the Lesser, not because he's of lesser importance than James, the brother of John, but because in the listing he always appears after James. Number 10 is Labius Thaddeus. Now, his other name is actually Judas. And my guess is after Judas Iscariot betrays Jesus, even though he may not have liked Labius Thaddeus, I mean, who doesn't like their middle name sometimes? I don't like mine. So he probably was like, you know what? Just call me Labius Thaddeus because I don't want to be confused with that joker named Judas. And then number 11 is Simon the Canaanite, also known as Simon the Zealot. And zealots were individuals that were adamantly opposed to the oppressive government of Rome. So Jesus chose many individuals with various backgrounds and even some that were even a little hostile um, in their belief systems. And then the last one, one of the most famous for bad reasons, I guess you could say infamous, is Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. So that Iscariot there is not his last name. It's from, he, it means he was from the area of Iscarot. That's the area he was from, and that's actually in the area of Judea. And if you remember from one of the lectures, in the Galilean ministries, the ministry where Jesus was loved and accepted, and the Judean ministries where he was hated. And interestingly, guess where Judas is from? Yep, that place where he is hated. So now that we've discussed who the the 12 were that Jesus chose for a specific mission, what was that mission? Letter B. He commissions them to, the, to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, it's important to note that there are two gospel commissions in the gospel of Matthew. The first one is right here in Matthew chapter 10, and it's to the Jews only. The other gospel commission is the one that you and I are under in Matthew 28, to go into all the world and preach the gospels. Now, this gospel commission, Matthew 10, is different than ours for many different reasons. Not only were they only to go to the Jews first, okay, or to the Jews, they also were given special powers to perform miracles. They were told not to bring anything with them because God would provide every single thing they needed. They were told that they would, um, people that received them would be blessed and those that didn't would be punished. That is the exact opposite of today. You and I are not going around performing miracles. We are supposed to bring stuff with us because it's dangerous. We get cursed out if we are too Christian sometimes. So we don't have those special blessings like they did. So this was a different gospel commission. Now let's move on to number three. 
only Matthew records the Olivet Discourse. And we already discussed this in a previous lecture. It's called the Olivet Discourse because he gives us on the Mount of Olives. And if you go back and even look at that lecture and the picture of the mount, it's not much of a mountain, it's actually more of a big hill, but he's on this hill, Mount Olive, at the Mount of Olives, and he is talking to them and the individuals that are following him. And he gives them a discourse that primarily focused upon the future events, most commonly called the tribulation. And they begin with the start of the tribulation. He's, or he starts with the beginning of the tribulation and his teaching goes all the way through the second coming of Christ and even down to the judgment of the nations. And then number four, the last one under this section. Matthew gives the most detailed great commission. Now remember, there's two gospel commissions in the gospel of Matthew. First one in Matthew 10 to only the Jews. And then Matthew 28, after Jesus' resurrection, he gives a second gospel commission that you and I are under today. And that is that we're supposed to go to everyone. And the commission is actually to go make disciples, make followers of Christ. How? By going, by baptizing, and by teaching. So that finishes up the teachings unique to Christ or, um, in Matthew. Now let's look at letter C. Miracles unique to Matthew. These are some miracles that Jesus performed, three in particular, that only Matthew talks about. Number one, only Matthew records the healing of two blind men two blind men. Now, after leaving a man named Jairus' home, he actually raised this lady or this man's daughter from the dead. There are two men crying outside that are saying, son of David, have mercy on us. Interestingly, by calling him the son of David, they're recognizing he is the Messiah, the rightful um, ruler of, of Israel, and the sit, one who could sit on the throne of David. And then after Jesus asked them if they believed he was able to heal them, they said yes. So Jesus touched their eyes, and they are immediately able to see. But he tells them not to tell anyone. Now the question has always come up, well, why would he say not to tell anybody? At this period of Jesus' ministry, and remember this is not put together chronologically, it's more topically, so even though Matthew 9 is towards the beginning, at this period of Jesus' ministry, it's very, very hostile in some areas of the, of the, of the known time of Israel that from there it was very hostile against Jesus. So he's trying to prolong his ministry as much as he can and make it to where he's able to, to reach people with the gospel like he wants to. So he tells them to be quiet. However, number two, only Matthew records the healing of the mute demoniac. In spite of Jesus' charge to the two blind men to not tell anyone about the miracle, they went and told everybody they could and brought one of their friends who was mute, who could not talk. And we find out the reason why he could not talk is because he was possessed by a demon. Jesus cast out the demon and immediately he was able to speak. Interestingly, the Pharisees watched this, and remember I told you they hated him. The Pharisees watched this and they accused him of being able to only do this because he has the power of Satan in him. That definitely crossed the line. And then number three, the last miracle unique to Matthew. Only Matthew records the coin in the mouth of the fish. The coin in the mouth of the fish. While Jesus is in Capernaum, there were people were there collecting money to pay the temple tax. And they ask Peter, does your master Jesus pay the tax? Well, Peter, in total Peter form, he speaks before he thinks. He says, yes, of course, my master pays the tax. So then Peter runs back to Jesus and finds him and says, Jesus, do you pay the temple tax? And Jesus tells Peter, look, go catch a fish. And he wasn't like saying, go play in the road. He was like, go catch a fish. And when you catch that fish, the exact, exact amount of money will be in that fish's mouth and give it to them for the temple tax. And which is obviously a huge miracle that Jesus performed by him allowing Peter to catch the one fish with that amount of money in its mouth. Now, how did that happen? Either one, Jesus just allowed it to be created in his mouth, which I don't really believe that was the case, or two, Jesus completely orchestrated the events that a fisherman had the money, it fell out of his boat. If you've ever been on a boat before, you know you lose things in the water. Fish love shiny objects. The money was falling to the ground. The fish thought it was food, swallowed it. Peter catches the fish. Now, to me, that is a greater miracle than just God creating it because he had to orchestrate all those events perfectly for Peter to catch the fish.
Well, that brings us to the end of the Gospel of Matthew. So let's move on to a new Gospel. The Gospel of Mark. Now let's go through the introduction section of the Gospel of Mark. Letter A. This Gospel account was written by John Mark. Now, we commonly just call him Mark. His full name was John Mark, but we usually leave out the John part to not confuse him with John the Apostle. And although, again, the author never identifies himself as Mark, just like with Matthew, the early church fathers have always ascribed it universally to him. Here's some interesting details about Mark. Number one. He was the son of Mary. Now, this is in no relation to the Marys in the Gospels, okay? This is a Mary mentioned in Acts chapter 12. And Mary was a friend of the apostles who is mentioned in Acts 12 because she's probably really wealthy. And it was in her house where the prayer meeting was held for Peter's deliverance from prison, which we'll get to when we get to the book of Acts. And this was actually the first place Peter went to after being released from jail. It's even believed that her home was the headquarters for the Christian leaders in Jerusalem Jerusalem in the exact location where the upper room discourse took place in John's cha John chapters three, or excuse me, thirteen through seventeen. Now let's look at number two. He was not one of the original twelve disciples. Now. In spite of that, it is highly probable that he was still an eyewitness of many of the events he describes. And given the information above that we know, we cannot deny that he was close to the 12 disciples. Some actually believe that he's the young man in Mark 14 that followed Jesus after his arrest, but fled away, the Bible says, naked after the men tried to capture him. Which, that word naked may mean he just didn't have a shirt on that was considered naked in that culture of that time. Um, but that's just a speculation. We only believe that because Mark's the only one that even mentions that. So it's kind of an odd thing for someone to mention. And especially since you must have been there to even notice the streaker. Maybe it was because he was the streaker. Um, so that's number two. Let's look at number three. He was the understudy to his cousin Barnabas and Paul. So he's the understudy to two individuals, Barnabas and Paul, but we find out that Barnabas is actually his cousin. This is because Paul writes that in Colossians 4 verse 10. And if you understand, well, we're going to get to a little bit later in the book of Acts, and if you remember this from any kind of studying you've ever done on your own, John Mark traveled with Barnabas and Paul on one of his missionary journeys on Paul's missionary journeys. However, for whatever reason, John Mark decides to abandon the missionary journey. He leaves and he goes back home. We don't know why. Some people you know, believe maybe he just got homesick. But whatever reason it was, this actually caused a pretty big rift between him and Paul until shortly before Paul's death. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 11, Paul writes to Timothy and says, bring John Mark with you because basically I got to get right with him. We've had some issues. Let's, let's make it right. Then letter B. This gospel account was written sometime between AD 62 and 64, which again, that's just for information purposes. There's a lot of debate on exactly what year, but as long as you have it sometime before AD 100, you're in a good area. Then letter C. This gospel account was written to display Jesus as the servant of Jehovah, the promised Messiah. And this, again, is a little bit of a, of a review of the overview of the gospel lesson we did in a previous lecture. But he emphasizes that Jesus is the servant, the of servant of Jehovah. And then letter D, if you remember this one as well, this gospel account's key word is immediately. And again, this fits the theme of the book, being that Jesus is a servant, so he is going to perform his duties immediately, right away, whenever he believes he needs to do them. So that is the introduction section. Now let's look at Roman numeral 2. Unique features of the Gospel of Mark. Just like we did with Matthew, we're going to go through some unique features and unique material that only the other Gospel writers will talk about. So let's look at Mark's unique features. Letter A, his Gospel account has no genealogy of Jesus. Why? Because again, if you're presenting him as a servant, we don't care who his servant's parents are. Then letter B, his Gospel account has no account of the virgin birth. No virgin birth. Again, no one is concerned with the birth of a servant. So, and, and possibly, Mark is also just assuming we already know a lot of these details, so he's not going to address them. And then letter C. 
His gospel account has no history of the childhood of Jesus. And again, maybe this goes back to the theme. You're not concerned with the upbringing and the childhood of a servant. So that's Roman number two. Or yeah, Roman number two, unique features of the gospel. Mark, let's move to Roman number three. Unique material to the gospel of Mark. So the last section we're going to deal with today is this unique material to Mark. But it is notable, I want you to make note of this, that 90% of the gospel of Mark is found in the two synoptic gospels. So if you look in your notes here, there's actually only three notable instances that only Mark includes. But let's look at those. So only Mark includes, letter A, the parable of the seed. This one is different than a very commonly uh, known one called the parable of the sower of the seed. So the parable of the seed here is when a man sows seed in the ground and it begins to grow without his knowledge of how it happens. So a farmer doesn't necessarily know have to know all the scientific details of how his crops grow. He just has to know how to plant it and grow. Nevertheless, fruit is produced and he will reap the benefits. So even though the farmer doesn't understand all the scientific information about it, if he puts it in the ground, takes care of it, fruit will grow out of it, and he will reap the benefits. And there is nothing here. Here's what Paul, or excuse me, what Jesus is trying to show is, is that there is nothing like seeing someone grow in the Lord through your instruction. Remember, Jesus loved to just show us earthly illustrations to remind us of eternal principles. The eternal principle here is giving the gospel to people and not just that but seeing it grow in them and seeing them mature in their faith and the application here is it is our job to give the word to others but the word does not need our help to produce fruit we don't have to know all the answers we don't have to know everything we just have to do our part like the farmer does and we will see fruit and reap the benefits then let her be only Mark records the healing of the blind man at Bethsaida. That last word, real weird, weird, weird word is Bethsaida. So here's what ends up happening with the blind man in Bethsaida. This is a weird instance, but I'm just going to tell you how it happened in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus takes this man by the hand, leads him out of town, spits on his eyes, puts his hand on him, and then he could see. And interestingly, after this chronologically is when Peter confesses that Jesus really is the Messiah because now he's witnessed him give sight to a blind man. So there's a few aspects of this that are interesting. First is that he leads him out of the town. Well, why is that? Because we find out actually in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus cursed the city of Bethsaida and said he would never do any more healings there because of their just just terrible attitude towards him. Well, he comes back to this area and there's a man who needs his healing and actually believes Jesus is who he says he believes. So he's not going to create a problem he can't un undo. So instead, he takes the man out of the town. So therefore, he didn't ever heal in the town again. He took him out of the town. Yeah, kind of, he, Jesus found a loophole. And then the other interesting details, he spit on his eyes. There is another illustration, um, or excuse me, another miracle mentioned in the Gospels about Jesus spitting on the ground, making a mud pie, and kind of putting it in the person's eyes. That's a different story. This one, actually, he just spits on his eyes, and then puts his eye, hands over him, and then he could see. And then the very last uh, miracle that is unique, or excuse me, miracle, the material that is unique to the Gospel of Mark is letter C. Only Mark records the fleeing or streaking of the young man. So after Judas led the band of men to capture Jesus, the disciples fled from Jesus. But Mark records that a young man followed him with just a linen cloth around him. Now, when the band of men notice him, they attempt to capture him too, but they grab his, his basically garment and he runs right out of it just like you know a kid would try to take the coat off of him when he's trying to grab a hold of him and it, then he leaves. Now again, some believe that this may be because this was John Mark and it, it don't confuse streaking and him being completely naked because most likely he did have an undergarment on, he just ran out of the top garment but still notable that he was a, one of the first streakers mentioned in the Bible. Well, that brings us to the end of Lecture 5 for BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please let me know. I'm here for you if you need me.